Through the Bartle test, which segments players into four archetypes, achievers, explorers, killers, and socializers, this man has set the timber of thought for game developers worldwide for the past 20 years. It is, it is my pride to introduce Richard Bartle. Uh, hi, folks. <laughs> it used to be that I got introduced for having co-written the very first virtual world, but uh, these days that doesn't happen. <laughs> um, okay, right, so... Um, in this talk, I'm going to talk about some of the problems yet to come for casual games. Um, they're only problems if you don't know that they're problems. I mean, they're opportunities if you're expecting them. Uh, because my background, you see, is in um, massively multiplayer online role-playing games. I've played them longer than any of you. Um, in fact, longer than any but one other person. Um, and he's not here. So um, my background's in MMOs. So I've seen what MMOs, what happened to them and how things developed. And some of the things I've seen, that we've seen before in MMOs, we're now seeing in casual games. So um, things, uh, things like free-to-play, if you were at the, the very first talk this morning, Aki's talk, you'd have heard that the first free-to-play game was Akia. That was a text mud back in 1997. Still makes about $2 million a year from selling virtual items that are just lines of text. Um, it also introduced um, player events, which you were hearing a couple of talks ago. Where, people were, where, where they would put on events and people would pay for that content. So these are things which we've had a long time in, in MMOs, which are now being, strictly speaking, reinvented. It's not as if people are, um, um, oh, remember Akia? They're just, it's an obvious idea. It's just that we've had them before in MUDs, so we know, and, and MMOs that follow, so we know what's happening. So we know what to expect and we know what to do about it. In some cases, the do is panic. In other cases, it's actually um, helpful. So... Um, Social, casual, mobile games, which is your stuff, um, these are great at embracing and engaging brand new players. People who weren't previously playing games, or didn't regard themselves as gamers at the least. They probably have played games, at least in the school, school playground. But they don't regard themselves as gamers, and, they, and these are great at pulling in new audiences. And there's lots of money to be made here. Sadly, not for me, but lots of money to be made. Um, however, the people who play games don't just play them. They absorb them. Uh, they come to understand what they're playing. And inevitably, they want to progress to more challenging content. So you give them games and they love it. Oh, yes, it's five minutes, blah, blah, blah. But over time, they're going to want something that's a bit more. Um, the games that players play today, the ones that are going out, the ones at top of the, um, of all the, the, whichever charts you want to look at, are training players in the ways of games. They are training people to play games. Um, and the games they play tomorrow will be more advanced than the ones they play today. Just like the music they listen to today isn't the music they listened to 10, 15 years ago and won't be the music they listen to 10, 15 years from now. Same with movies, same with books. People's tastes grow as they're exposed more to a medium. And we've known about this in um, MMOs for decades. Um, players' tastes in those um, change in predictable ways. So we know how people's cha tastes change. They always follow one of actually four paths, but the, the, the majority will follow one path, which we call, well, I call, the main sequence. And um, this is what it is. Um, I was told I had to put a uh, player types thing in here, otherwise I wouldn't be let out of the building. So here we go, killer to explorer to achiever to socializer. There you go, um, player types. Basically, people start off as a killer. They, if, you, if you get a group of 30 people, stick them in a game, uh, in a text mud, they've never played it before, the first thing they will attempt to do is kill one another. Um, I do this every year with my um, final year students. Most of the time, I manage to stop them before that spreads into the real world. Um, but they do attempt to kill each other's characters. After they've learned that that doesn't really work, because when you get killed, you have to start all over again. Oh, permadeath. Um, they go on to be explorers. They try to find how big the world is. They explore. They get, they get further around. They, um, 
Having discovered what the, the, the boundaries are, whether they're physical or social, they then go on to find out what, the, um, what they can do within those boundaries. So how far away they are, um, what, what, what possibilities exist. Having found out what the possibilities are, they will then use those to try and win the game on their terms. And then having won the game on their terms, they end up as gnarled old timers who are playing just for fun. Um, so the, the basic is find the boundaries, explore what's inside the boundaries. This can be breadth, you know, going to different places, or depth, figuring out all the details of things, and then going on wikia and sharing it. Um, trying to beat the content in whatever way the content says um, you're beating it and then just hanging out with your friends afterwards. So this is the path that people followed. We've had people, we've got people who play Mud 2, my follow-up text game, been playing it for 25 years, they are still there. In fact, 30 years in at least one case. Um, th they're just hanging around with their friends. It's just a place you go, like Leicester. Um, probably less dangerous. Um, this happens for pretty well all MMO players who are playing the game for fun, not if you're playing it as a designer or as a, an academic or as a journalist or as a gold farmer or anything like that. People who are playing these games for fun will always follow this progression. They'll always start off trying to find out what limits there are. Am I allowed to swear? Oh, no. Am I allowed to swear? Oh, yes, okay. Um, am I allowed to issue racist uh, abuse? Oh, no. Oh, you okay, know, so they'll find out what the, the, the social boundaries are, the physical boundaries are, can I walk through walls? No. Then they'll progress on to exploring to find out what they can, um, what the possibilities are within those boundaries, and then they'll go on to achieving it. So this happens to all the players. Now, casual games aren't MMOs, but a similar thing happens. Or at least I'm, uh, I'm saying a similar thing happens. Um, you, can, uh, you can ignore me if you like, but you're not paying me for this, so I don't care. Um, players find out what games are on offer, so they, however they find out, what, find out the, the, these games they might want to play. They explore which ones of these they like, particular ty types of games. Maybe they like find the hidden objects, maybe they like match three. They get good at them, and then they move on. Now, importantly, this affects their relationship not only to individual games, but to all games of the same genre. So. Once they've played Candy Crush Saga, they're not going to be going off and looking for other um, identical but slightly different th um, things that don't involve the word candy because you can get sued for that. Um, match three games. I mean, they're, they're going to look for something which progresses. Um, otherwise, I mean, this is out of um, Raf Costa's book. Um, basically, this is a, a guy playing on a console complaining it's just like some other game on a console which because he's played so many games on, on an arcade console, he knows them. Um, this is an um, all-good game. If, if you've got a game designer on your staff and they haven't got Raf Caster's book, then you really ought to tell them to go and get it quickly, or just reduce their salary. Um, all good game designers have got that book. Now, um, there's a distribution of experience of players in games. Um, I can give you a rough idea of what it looks like for MMO players. So a game's been launched, a new MMO's been launched. After a few weeks, it looks kind of like this. Um, this is just very rough, obviously. So you, there's quite a lot of players at the beginners, beginning. Some of them drop off because they don't like the game or they've gone on vacation or something. And then you've got quite a few, roughly the same amount at each level, except for the end, where the people, the, the content locusts, as they're called, have descended, played their way through, got to the end in rapid time. So it kind of looks like that after a few weeks. Now, pro players progress at different rates, which is why you've got some down here and roughly the same number here. They're just progressing at different rates. Some of them will be spending a lot of time consuming content. Some of them will be spending a lot of time trying to work things out or chatting but they're heading towards the end. Now, after a few months, the picture's kind of different. It's like this. Lots of players at the early levels, as before, they just drop off. They, these are people where they've, um, they've tried the game, didn't like it, they've gone. Their character's still there, maybe. Maybe they're a second account, it's just gone. Hardly anybody in this area here, so all the content you created for these people is not being consumed. All those dungeons you did for level 30 characters are being bypassed. 
Sometimes you see little spikes here. There used to be one about here for World of Warcraft um, when people got their mount at level 40, and then they quit because that was the closest goal that they could achieve. And once they got that, then they quit. So you sometimes you see the spikes. And then you get the end, and then all the players are bunched up at the end. Those are your active players. And this is what happens with pretty well every MMO. And the, the, when they add content, they just add more levels. So it goes like this, and then it goes up and up and up. Uh, and then they have to speed up getting from the, the end to here, because the horizon's are advancing. So you have to speed up how people get to it. So although players do progress at different rates, they do eventually get to the end. And then there's a the question, what happens at the end? Well, um, when players reach the end, they expect end game content. Um, the, the players of MMO, they get to the end, and instead of going up levels, then it's basically getting gear or something like that, or PvP. They expect there to be something to, that happens when you get to the end. And it's going to be the same with casual games. People who have played all the best um, match three games, when they get to the end, what are they going to do next? They're not just going to replay it from the start. They want some end game. Now, at the moment, you've got millions of people playing casual games. Um, my wife says she doesn't play it, but when I look at the fingerprints on the iPad, I know she does. Um, these people are learning to play games. And over time, you're going to see the same curve. There'll be a spike for people who didn't play games to start with as children much. That'll probably tail off because everyone's going to have played games 20 years from now. Um, then there'll be a um, level curve, just a, a level line with people who are advancing through old um, games which aren't very sophisticated. Then you'll get to the end where most of the people are, and they want more sophisticated games. So what are you going to give them? Um, so although you will be having people playing your games in the future, just like the ones you're making now, they won't be the same people who are playing them at the moment. Nobody will be playing Candy Crush Saga. I keep going about that one because that's the one that's... Uh, uh, it, it's got bad patent things, so I've got a reason to dislike it. Um, these people who get to the end of your game, they're, they're not, they've stopped playing it. They're not going to play the same game now that they were playing years from now. Ten years ago, everybody was playing Snake on their Nokia. They're not playing Snake now. You can still play Snake on your Nokia. Well, if you've got a Nokia or a Snake. Um, but you can't... Um, but, but most people aren't. They've moved on to other games. So where will the people who are playing your games at the moment move on? They will have to move on. They because people just won't play the same games. You'd have to be like in your 70s to play the same word game every day for 10 years, like the guy at lunch did. Um, well, they're going to move wherever you point them. So if you say this is the natural progression, you don't have to say it like that, but if you make it obvious that this is the, this is the, the place to go, that's where they're going to go. So long as it is actually progress in terms of sophistication. So the players will regard this as being more of an intellectual exercise or more visceral, depending on what kind of fun that they're getting from the game. So you can direct them to another game. So knowing this, um, what can you do? Well, there's a, people have tried this, but they've got kind of the wrong, wrong way to do it. Um, there's an obvious way to do it, which is wrong. And this is to find a game which is already more sophisticated and then graft on casual um, features. So you say, um, OK, we've got this MMO that's far more sophisticated than this, but let's add some casual features. Let's put uh, mini games in it and let's put uh, easy um, spoon-fed content in it so that the, the casual players will play the game and then they'll go on to the, um, the more sophisticated game. Well, no, they won't because they look at it and see it's a hugely sophisticated game, and they just won't try it no matter how much ice cream and, and, and chocolate you give them at the beginning. Um, what you should do is to graft more sophisticated features onto casual games. So you evolve casual games rather, rather than unevolve MMOs. And this way, you're taking the players with you. And before they know it, they will be playing an MMO. They may not see themselves as gamers, but that's what they'll be, because you'll have taken them along with you by adding incrementally more sophisticated, more interesting content 
they'll come with you. If you don't, they'll go off and look for, for other games which have got more content. Um, the analogy for this is um, what they do with, with books. Um, if, if someone's learning to read, children are learning to read, they start off with picture books, there's pictures, lots of text. What happens over time is that you remove the number of pictures so that books for 12-year-olds, um, 11-year-olds, they've got lots of pages before you occasionally get a little picture in them. The, the thing you shouldn't do is illustrate war and peace because that would be lots of pictures and they would not be able to make any sense of the story, especially if it was in the original Russian. Unless they were Russian, of course. Um, another um, wrong way is to make mistake um, complexity for sophistication. Sophistication, what I mean by that, is a game which is, uh, offers more intellectual um, activity or more of whatever activity is core to the game than, than previously. Now, just making it more complex, doesn't, that just makes it harder. doesn't necessarily make it more interesting. It's, it's not going to attract players to, to want to play it. They're just going to say, oh, this is just getting harder and harder. I bet at some point they're going to want to make me pay money to make it easier. Now, OK, some people do demand more detailed content. So uh, if you ever played one of those hide, um, find the hidden object games, yeah, OK, well, they used to be quite hard. You'd look at these pictures, and there'd be 20 objects. And then you look at it today, and there's, it's underneath a bridge, and there's 100 objects, and there's like dead babies and crocodile teeth, and who knows what else under this bridge, and you've got to find the matchstick. Well, OK, that's pretty hard. But if you're an expert in these kind of games, you'll just take it in really easily. Um, you won't even bother pressing the button that, for a small fee, flashes where the things could be. Now, this is the way, this is complexity, but eventually the pe these people who do this kind of thing, they, they, they burn out because it just gets further and f more and more complicated. It's like, yes, I could do a 20,000 piece jigsaw, but actually, you know, I kind of like doing the 1,500 pieces ones because you know, they, they just fill the right kind of time. They're just as hard as the 20,000 ones and they don't take up all my floor. Um, so people who do this kind of thing, they burn out. And then, they've, then you've lost them forever. They're not going to come back to those kind of games because as far as they're concerned, they've done them. So they'll look for something else to, uh, to drill into and it'll perhaps not even be a game. It could be something else, an indie kart racing or something. So what you would be doing is you'd be trying to lead um, them to your other offerings, which perhaps have a, a find a hidden object component but there would be more of an intellectual thing to it. So there'd have to be some relationship between them, perhaps, um, for solving some crime, perhaps. Before you know it, then they're suddenly interested in crime-solving games. Whatever. Um, other people will want content that's more abstract. than um, So rather, rather than drilling down, they want something which is more um, intellectual, more, more thinking. Um, so they would want ever harder strategic reasoning. Again, this would you could burn out on this, but this has got a lot more potential than drilling down because there's an, an awful lot of things you can do with strategic reasoning. Um, few people um, who play games would want more of the same. What they want is more of the same but better, where better is involving some thought. Now, an important thing here is that you still need to sell your less sophisticated content, uh, even if it's just in small volumes. So even though you know the vast bulk of your players are going to be moving on to your super clever match 17 game, um, you do actually still need the, the, er the, the easy stuff because that's the ramp. This is the, the, the gateway, as we heard in an earlier talk, um, where if people have to learn these things in order to get to the higher um, competencies. If there's no um, entry-level content, then they can't reach the advanced content. And we've seen this before. Um, some of you out here will have no idea what an adventure game is, particularly a text adventure game. These were the, the big sellers in like 1984, 1985. All, all the games shops were full of text adventures. 
Um, and the reason that you won't have heard of them is because um, these games got so esoteric, they lost their audience. Um, nobody could figure out what the puzzles were. This is from Gabriel Knight 3, which was one of the best-selling, award-winning, fantasy echo um, text adventure games. So basically, you needed to steal a moped. To st in order to steal your moped, you needed to do um, pickpocket your friend's passport, then go and place masking tape over a hole in a shed wall, um, and then you chase a black cat through that hole into the shed. Because you put masking tape on there, some of the cat's fur will have come off on there. So you can take the fur off, stick it to your face with syrup that you found in the kitchen, and then you'd have a false moustache. Then you would have to go and steal a marker pen from a, the desk at the, the hotel and by sending the person off to get some candies. And once you've got the marker pen, you could alter the, the, the picture on your friend's passport so it had a moustache. And then you could show the, the picture of yourself and look, it's got a moustache, I've got a moustache, it must be the same person. That's the kind of puzzle that you got in text adventures towards the end. That's why people said, what the hell? No one can solve that. You have to go onto the web to find out what the answers are. And then when you find out what the answers are, you don't understand what the answers are. I've got to fashion a false moustache so I look like someone who doesn't have one. This is the kind of thing that happens if you go into too much detail. Um, eventually, you, you cut off the original. It's like it's completely inaccessible. It's like modern art. You have to have looked at all the other art in order to appreciate the modern art. If people don't like the uh, other art, then they're not going to get there. So to summarize, um, players refine their tastes as they play. We know this. They've done it the whole time in MUDs, um, text adventures, all the way up to MMOs. The music you listen to today isn't the music in your youth, but you must have listened to some the music of your youth in order to appreciate the music you listen to today. People will need to have played and will continue to need to play the games you're giving them at the moment in order to get to the games you're giving them in the future. If you order same, if you offer a same but harder games, that will be profitable now. I'm not going to pretend it's not. You will make lots of money out of that. Ultimately, it's self-defeating. So you should aim to provide a graduated player experience to get them to your end games. And now you've got to write the end games. And that's that. Oh, wow. Only over in by two minutes. Thank you. Um, <laughs> fun fact, guys. Uh, Richard co-created the first virtual world. I don't know if you guys <laughs> did I knew that. that. <laughs> did, did he mention that? And um, I'd like to get one question from the audience who has a question for the great uh, Richard Bartle. Uh, I heard the sarcasm in that. No, no sarcasm. We have, we have a question back here. I believe this was the first gentleman to raise his hand. Hi, thanks for sharing. Uh, that was really interesting. Uh, my question is about the book which you mentioned. Uh, I didn't catch the title of the book, and I'm also curious about what the backstory of that is. Book? Theory of Fun. Oh, Theory of Fun for Game Design by Raf Costa. It's, um, it goes into the psychology of why people play games. It's um, half the books. On the left-hand side, it's words. On the right-hand side, it's pictures. Um, the, it, the, um, it was written 10 years ago, and the 10th anniversary second edition has just come out in color. That's why that was a color picture rather than a black and white one. Um, if you are interested at all in why people play games, then that gives you a theory of fun. It's not the only theory of fun, but it's the best that there is, and the only competition the second edition has is the first edition. So. Yeah, uh, Raph Costa, R-A-P-H-K-O-S-T-E-R. Raph was the lead designer of Ultima Online, Star Wars Galaxy. Thank um, you so much. Uh, <laughs> it, was a, it was a fantastic talk. Thank you.